Europe often tries to portray itself as progressive. It's a big part of its soft power. But the reality is below the superficial surface level of rhetoric and propaganda, the reality is that Europe is still deeply colonialist and extremely racist. And this October, we saw one of the most jaw-dropping examples of this in a speech that was given by the basically the foreign minister, the top foreign policy official of the European Union, Josep Borrell. And he gave a speech in which he said that Europe is a beautiful garden and a beacon of civilization for the world. And he said, Europeans are gardeners. And then he said, the rest of the world, the vast majority of the population in the global south, he used the term emerging countries. So that means the global south. Those countries, he claimed, the non-white countries, are not a beautiful garden like Europe. Instead, they are a barbaric jungle, a violent jungle. And he said that Europe is important to the world, he said, boasting of how great Europe is. Europe has to bring civilization to the global south. The gardeners have to help protect and save the people in the jungle. And he said, if they don't, they're going to be invaded. This is straight up colonialist, racist rhetoric that says that white Europeans are superior to supposed knuckle-dragging cavemen in the global south. And he just said this all completely openly, and he said it in a speech at the European Union. I have an article about this, and I will link to it in the description below. This report is based on the official transcript of Borrell's remarks that he made on October 13th at the opening of the European Diplomatic Academy. But if you don't believe everything that I said, I'm now going to show video clips from this insanely racist rant that shows that Europe is still deeply neo-colonialist and sees the global south not as independent and sovereign parts of the world, but areas of the world that need to be colonized by Europe. And of course, what he doesn't mention is Europe wants to colonize them in order to take their natural resources. Here is the shocking clip. Here, Bruges is a good example of a European garden. Yes, Europe is a garden. We have built a garden. Everything works. It's the best combination of a political freedom, economic prosperity, and social cohesion that the humankind has been able to build. There's three things together. And here, Bruges is maybe the, the good representation of a beautiful things, intellectual life, well-being, the rest of the world, and you know very well, Federica, is not exactly a garden. The rest of the world, most of the rest of the world, is a jungle. And the jungle could invade the garden. And the gardeners should take care of it, should take care of the garden, but they will not protect the garden by, by walls, by building walls. <laughs> a nice small garden surrounded by high walls in order to prevent the jungle coming in is not going to be a solution because the, the jungle has a strong growth capacity and the walls will never be high enough in order to protect the garden. The gardeners have to go to the jungle. The Europeans has to be much more engaged with the rest of the world. Otherwise, the rest of the world will invade us by different ways and means. Yes, this is my most important message. We have to be much more engaged with the rest of the world. Now, there's so many things to respond to in that just complete nonsense that he said there. First of all, the idea that everything works, he says in Europe, everything works, that would come to a surprise to the many thousands, potentially millions of Europeans right now who are protesting on the streets against the energy crisis, the economic recession, the decline in living standards, the austerity pol policies imposed, the neoliberal capitalist policies in imposed that have made their lives harder, that have cut healthcare, have cut education. I mean, 
he's a, he's claiming that everything works in Europe as if this place is like a utopia is completely absurd. But then there is also getting to this completely condescending and racist rhetoric where he says that if Europe does not engage with the rest of the world, he says, and when he says engage, of course, we all know what he means. He means dictate terms to the global south. It's not mutual engagement. It's not bilateral engagement. This is unilateral. And he says, if Europe doesn't engage with the rest of the world, he says, otherwise, the rest of the world will invade us. This is incredible. Europe, this area of the world is responsible for the worst empires in history. For 500 years, going back to the late 1400s, European colonialist powers have invaded every single corner of the planet. They have pillaged and plundered and murdered and committed genocide and ethnic cleansing, removing indigenous peoples off of their land, committing genocide on a massive level never seen before in human history, including uh, Nazism and fascism, which by the way, were uniquely European, including the mass genocide that the British Empire oversaw in the Indian subcontinent, or the French mass murder of over a million Algerians during the Algerian War for Independence. Or, of course, the ethnic cleansing and genocide of indigenous nations in the modern day Americas. Not only the United States, also Canada, some parts of Latin America. We're talking about Europe. Europeans are the people more than anyone in human history who have invaded more countries, who have committed more atrocities and more crimes against humanity. And yet the top foreign policy chief of the European Union, this imperialist neoliberal institution, is accusing the global south of threatening to invade them. This is projection of exactly what European colonialists have done for hundreds of years. Are, are people forgetting the millions of Africans who were enslaved by European colonialists in order to steal their labor? Literally, the wealth of Europe and North America was built on stealing the natural resources of the global south and mass enslavement to steal the labor of African slaves. I mean, th th Western capitalism is fundamentally based on genocide and ethnic cleansing and war, and the wars have never ended. And yet we hear the, one of the top officials in the European Union accuse the global South of exactly what, they, what the European colonialists have done and still do today still do across Latin America, Africa, Asia, is incredible. But as if that weren't enough, that, that, that wasn't the only extremely ridiculous thing that the EU foreign policy chief said in his speech. Here he continues with this racist rhetoric. Here's from the same speech on October 13th. And believe me, Europe is a good example for many things. And the world, the world needs Europe. The world needs Europe. My experience of traveling around the world is that people look at us as a beacon. Why so many people want to come to Europe? Are there flows of illegal or irregular migrants going to Russia? Not many. No, they come into Europe. But for good reasons. For good reasons. So keep the garden. Be good gardeners. But your duty will be not to take care of the garden itself, but the jungle outside. Thank you. Listen to what he says here. He says, the world needs Europe. He says, people look at us as a beacon. I mean, this is, again, so condescending. The world needs Europe. Yeah, the region of the world that committed genocide and colonized the entire planet. The world needs Europe. No, Europe needs the global south to extract its natural resources, which is exactly why Europe is going through an economic crisis right now, because Europe doesn't have cheap energy anymore from Russia, a country that was basically colonized by the U.S. and Europe in the 1990s after overthrowing the Soviet Union. And the reason they hate Russia now is because it refuses to be a colony. That's why Europe is trying to go to Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Egypt and apartheid Israel and all these countries, which is apartheid Israel, by the way, is part of 
this process of European colonization that continues to this day. Israel is a European Western settler colonialist project in the heart of West Asia. So anyway, the point is, Europe has to go to all these regions of the world, largely in the global south, in order to get their natural resources. Europe needs the global south. The global south doesn't need Europe. So then he says, why do so many people come to Europe? Are there flows of illegal or irregular migrants going to Russia? N not many, no. They're coming to Europe. Yeah, why are they going to Europe? Because Europe and the U.S. destroyed their countries and waged war on them and imposed sanctions on them and underdeveloped and de-developed their countries over hundreds of years of colonial exploitation. NATO destroyed Libya. The Libyan state was destroyed by Libya in 2011. This is not ancient history. The U.S. and Europe waged a brutal proxy war on Syria for a decade. It's still going on today. A third of Syrian territory, where the majority of the oil and wheat is located, is still illegally being mil militarily occupied by the U.S. right now. The U.S. and Europe devastated Syria, unleashing Salafi jihadist fanatics like ISIS and Al-Qaeda to try to destroy the country. After, of course, they did the same in Iraq before that and Afghanistan. This is all, this continues to happen today. These countries are destabilized by Europe and U.S. imperialism. And the countries that are not, they don't, have, they don't have open active wars, have sanctions, like on Iran and so many countries in the global south. So why do, why, do, why do migrants and refugees go to Europe? Because they're fleeing violence and instability caused by U.S. and European imperialism and war. And they're also going to the rich imperialist countries in the core of the capitalist world system because there are more jobs and there's more money because that wealth came from imperial colonial plunder of the global south that's what capitalism was founded on was stealing the wealth of the global south you can't separate capitalism from imperialism and colonialism european colonialists created capitalism as a world system so yeah people from poor areas of the world sometimes migrate to the rich areas to try to make money because their parts of the world have been colonized and they're poor because of colonialism and imperialism. Because the wealth was stolen from them and used to develop the rich imperialist countries. So once again, this shows the incredible racist condescension of these European ruling class leaders. And of course, this is not just because of racism. This is the racist ideology used to justify their imperialist plunder of the planet so they can continue to steal resources and super exploit wealth in the global south. So here he continues, Josep Borrell, Borrell, again, this is the foreign policy chief of the European Union, the top foreign policy official. Here he continues and explains why he thinks that Europe is supposedly superior. And he says it's because we have institutions. Here, here's this clip. And if there is a big difference between Europe and the rest of the world, well, the rest of the world, and understand me what I mean, no? Uh, it's that we have strong institutions. The most important thing for the quality of life of the people is institutions. The big difference between developed and not developed is not economy, it's institutions. If we have a judiciary, a neutral, independent judiciary, most efficiently, if we have uh, systems of uh, distributing the revenue, if we have uh, elections which provide a free choice for the citizens, if we have the red lights controlling the traffic and people taking the garbage. Now, when I heard this, I just couldn't help but laugh. I mean, on so many levels. First of all, it shows how deeply racist and condescending these EU political leaders are. He, he claims that in the global south, people don't have traffic lights or garbage collectors. What the hell are you talking about? I have traveled extensively across Latin America in most countries in Latin America. They all have traffic lights. They all have garbage collectors. This is just completely ridiculous propaganda. And then he says, in Europe, we have a, a neutral, independent judiciary, which apparently other countries don't have. That would be news to Julian Assange. 
a political prisoner who's being tortured in Britain's high security prison for so-called terrorists and square, scare quotes because he committed the so-called crime of doing journalism, of exposing the crimes of U.S. and European imperialism around the world. Julian Assange would be surprised to hear of the so-called neutral independent judiciary. So would the many political prisoners in the United States, including Mumia Abu-Jamal, the black revolutionary and journalist who is a political prisoner, including Leonard Peltier, the indigenous political prisoner. There are so many in the United States. And then even in Europe, by the way, let's keep in mind that Joseph Borrell, the current EU foreign policy chief, he was previously foreign minister of Spain. He's from Spain and specifically he's from Catalonia. And in Spain right now, there is a famous Catalan political prisoner, Pablo Acel, who is a communist rapper, a leftist musician who did raps condemning the Spanish monarchy and Spanish imperialism and capitalism. And he was imprisoned for his music, for his raps. That's the great independent neutral judiciary in the so-called democracy of Spain, which, by the way, is still a constitutional monarchy. So, well, the barbaric imperialists in Spain and Europe are imprisoning musicians for criticizing their monarchy. The, the top EU foreign policy official says that Europe is superior to the supposedly barbaric global south because they have an independent free judiciary. And then he says, we have systems of di distributing the revenue. That means taxation. Every country on earth has taxation. And by the way, a lot of countries in the global south have less inequality than Europe and certainly than the United States, which is extremely unequal, an extremely unequal a society with tons of inequality and homelessness. So, I mean, this is just, this shows this deep neo-colonial mentality in these European imperialist politicians. Now, of course, I think he recognized when he was giving this speech that, oh, well, maybe people are going to interpret these comments as racist because they blatantly are racist. So he tried to save face and he threw away in, a, in one line uh, here. He threw away this. He said, oh, well, uh, you know, we shouldn't impose on the global south by force because that would be neocolonialism. Here's that quote. Uh, I cannot go to uh, emerging countries and build institutions for them. They have to be built by them. Otherwise, it would be a kind of neocolonialism. And the big difference between us and the important part of the rest of the world is we have institutions. So, so there, after spending, uh, you know, half an hour talking about how Europe is superior and a garden and beautiful and the global south are barbaric, you know, jungle dwellers and apes is basically what he's saying. He says, oh, well, we don't want neocolonialism, but that's exactly what the European Union is. It's an instrument of European neocolonialism to extract the wealth and resources of the global south and exploit their labor to enrich European capitalists at the expense of workers in Europe right now whose lives continue to get worse and worse. Now, by the way, speaking of Europeans' lives getting worse and worse, of course, in the speech on October 13th, Josep Borrell mentioned the proxy war in Ukraine because he can't go 30 seconds without mentioning Ukraine and how evil Russia supposedly is. And he made it clear that Russia is part of the so-called jungle when he was talking about Europe being the enlightened garden. And what was interesting about this speech, aside from all the insanely racist neocolonial rhetoric, is that the EU foreign policy chief acknowledged that Europe is waging a new Cold War on both Russia and China. And the way he said it is he said, the post-Cold War era has ended. The post-Cold War era has ended. So that what he's saying is that we're now in a new Cold War. Listen to this very interesting comment here. Now we are definitely out of the Cold War and the post-Cold War. The post-Cold War has finished with the Ukrainian war, with the Russian aggression to Ukraine. At the same time in this, in this speech, we also saw that Borrell, he praised the U.S. diplomat George Kennan, who was himself one of the architects of the Cold War, the first Cold War 
in the U.S. State Department. He was a hardline Cold Warrior. He was also specifically the architect of the containment policy toward the Soviet Union. And Borrell, he praised George Kennan. So that shows that once again, these European neo-colonialist politicians are themselves new Cold Warriors. They want a new Cold War. And what is the goal of this new Cold War? Well, the top EU foreign policy official, Borrell, he made it clear the, that Europe's goal is regime change in Russia. It is to overthrow Putin's government in Moscow and install a compliant Western puppet regime that can be integrated into the Western-led so-called rules-based order in which, of course, the U.S. and European imperialists make the rules and order everyone around on behalf of Wall Street and on behalf of the city of London and the big corporations and financial institutions and banks. So here, Borrell, he says very clearly, the goal is post-Putin Russia after the war in Ukraine is over. And of course, he, he opposes any peace talks to end the war in Ukraine. He has said very clearly again and again that the only way of ending the war is on the battlefield. Here is a tweet that I included in my article, which I will link to in the description below. Here is a tweet in which Borrell said that the war will be, this war will be won on the battlefield. So he's opposed all attempts at peace talks over the proxy war in Ukraine. And then he said in this speech, the goal is forcibly subordinating post-Putin Russia and integrating it into the West. But after this war, it will become a, a period of instability and we will have to build a new security order. And how do we integrate Russia, the post-Putin Russia, on this world order? Is something that will put a lot of work to the people thinking on the diplomacy and how to, to practice and to implement it. Now, there was one thing that the, the, the EU, EU foreign policy chief Borrell said in the speech that I do agree with. He said, we are living in a time of exceptional change. He said, the, the, the so-called rules-based system, again, they, Western imperialists love this term. Of course, the Western imperialists make those rules. But he said that the system is challenged like never before. He said, we are living in the moment of creation of a new world. Here's that clip. And we are certainly living also a moment of creation of a new world. Because this world is changing a lot of things. And certainly is changing the European Union. And this war will create a different European Union. So I actually do agree with that. But of course, the reason that the US and Europe are waging this new Cold War is to try to prevent the end of the unipolar imperialist world system that they've created, that they created after the overthrow of the Soviet Union and the counter revolutions in the socialist bloc in the 1990s. They want to recolonize the entire planet. They want to prevent the rise of the global south, which is trying to build a multipolar world. And they want to resubordinate the global south in order to continue to have this capitalist free lunch built on the imperialist exploitation of natural resources and labor in the global south. So that's why they're so concerned about this new world that is being born. And by the way, in, in another funny comment in this speech, the only time that Borrell ever acknowledged one criticism, the only criticism he acknowledged is he said that there are people who say that the European Union is simply following the United States, that Europe is subordinated to US imperialism, which it objectively is, and more and more so, especially now, because Europe is refusing to import Russian energy, which means it's more and more heavily rel reliant, dependent on US energy, specifically US liquefied natural gas, LNG exports. So in, in his speech, Borrell said, okay, well, people say that we're dependent on the US, but no, we're not, we're not dependent. We, we have an independent foreign policy. Of course, he didn't prove any examples of that, but here's that clip. There are people who say that uh, this war m means the end for the European Union to have a foreign policy because we are following blindly the US. This narrative exists. Yesterday in the plane, I was reading nice articles explaining this approach. 
And from my side, it's just the contrary. The, this war has been an occasion for the European Union to be more assertive and to push for the creation of a European stand from the foreign policy side and also from the military and defense perspective. So that was a pretty funny kind of revealing uh, uh, comment. As I guess millennials say, don't tell on yourself, man. Well, also in the speech, in the same vein of this very condescending rhetoric that he had toward the global south, the top EU foreign policy official, Joseph Borrell, he, con he boasted that the European Union had spent a lot of time, energy, and resources in trying to convince countries at the United Nations to vote on October 12th to condemn the incorporation of the former Ukrainian territories of Lugansk, Donetsk, Kyrgyzstan, and Saporizhia into Russia, and what they call this, risk, this evil uh, annexation. Of course, they, they ignore and they dispute that there were any people in Eastern former Eastern Ukraine, who were Russian speakers, by the way, and ethnically Russian, they deny that it meant that they wanted to join Russia in any way and that these were all forced, uh, you know, forced referenda. Obviously, there is a war going on and these were areas militarily controlled by Russia. But that doesn't mean that everyone living in those territories who, again, speak Russian or ethnic Russians were forced at gunpoint to vote. That's absurd. Anyway, the point is that in this speech, he boasted that, that at the United Nations, the EU was pressuring countries around the world to vote to condemn Russia. And he complained that too many countries in the global south abstained and refused to condemn Russia. Here's that clip. And thanks God the system reacted very well yesterday with the vote of the United Nations, with more than 140 people rejecting the illegal annexation, the forced annexation of a part of Ukraine into the Russia Federation. And we are happy, and I am very happy of this result. There was a lot of work behind it, a lot of reaching out with many people in order to, to be sure that uh, we were above the 140 line, which was the result of the first vote. But if, if I can say, and even if there is uh, an streaming, I have also to say that I am worried because there were too many abstentions. When 20% of the, more or less, 20% of the world community uh, decided mm, not to support or not to reject the, the Russia annexation, for me it's too, too many. It's too many. And it is very interesting to see this, the Global South's participation in this UN vote that was held on October 12th in terms of the incorporation of these former Ukrainian territories into the Russian Federation. Here are countries in the Global South that voted against the resolution, including Syria, Nicaragua, the DPRK, Belarus. Here are countries that abstained. Algeria, Armenia, Bolivia, Burundi, Central African Republic, China, Congo, Cuba, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Guinea, Honduras, India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Laos, Mali, Mongolia, Mozambique, Namibia, Pakistan, South Africa, South Sudan, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Tajikistan, Tanzania, Thailand, Togo, Uganda, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, and Zimbabwe. So note, there's, there's a trend here. The Western imperialist powers overwhelmingly have united against Russia, and countries in the global south either oppose the, this proxy war explicitly or are neutral. And all those countries I just named that abstained in this vote or voted against it on, on October 12th, the United Nations, are in the global south, including the largest, the most populous countries on earth, China and India and Pakistan, and also a significant number of countries that have leftist, revolutionary, anti-imperialist governments, including Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Bolivia, the new left-wing government in Honduras. So very interesting, a very interesting vote. And of course, that explains why the European Union is frustrated, as Borrell said clearly, that a lot of countries in the global south refuse to join the West in its imperialist, 
proxy war to try to overthrow the Russian government and install a new post-Putin regime, as Burrell said. And speaking of that, finally, I'm going to conclude this analysis here today talking about other comments that Burrell made about the proxy war in Ukraine, which are very concerning. For anyone who's concerned about trying to preserve human life on this planet, <laughs> which hopefully is everyone on Earth, we should be very preoccupied by the comments made by the top EU foreign policy official, Joseph Burrell, in the speech he made on October 13th. He talked about the possibility of nuclear war over Ukraine. And of course, he said that Russia is the one threatening nuclear war, ignoring the Western nuclear threats. And of course, ignoring, of course, that the United States, uh, which, the, which Burrell and the EU worships as their colonial protector, the U.S. is the only country on Earth that has actually used nuclear weapons on a civilian population, and not once, but twice. But anyway, in these remarks, he was extremely cavalier, which is very concerning. And Joseph Burrell said that if there is a nuclear war, the Russian army will be annihilated. So this is very concerning. Listen to this clip here. And then there is the nuclear threat. And then there is the nuclear threat. And, and Putin is saying that he's not bluffing. Well, he cannot afford bluffing. He cannot afford bluffing. And it has to be clear that uh, the people who support Ukraine and the European Union and the member states and the US and NATO are not bluffing neither. And in any nuclear attack against Ukraine will uh, create an answer. Not a nuclear answer, but a such a powerful answer from the military side that the Russian army will be inoculated and Putin should not be bluffing. This is a serious moment in the history and we have to show our unity and our strength and our determination, complete determination. That, those are scary comments to hear from the top foreign policy official in the European Union. We should not, and no one on earth should be talking about nuclear war. Again, this could destroy all of life on the planet with nuclear winter. It could bring about literally an apocalypse. It is extremely troubling to hear Western politicians talk about this, especially as nonchalantly as they're addressing this, and especially considering as I said earlier, Joseph Burrell has repeatedly stressed that Europe refuses to have peace talks to end the proxy war in Ukraine with a peaceful settlement. He, he claims to be a diplomat. In this speech, he talked about how important diplomacy is, but he is, opposes diplomacy with Russia. He, he has continued to say the only way the war in Ukraine will, be, will end is on the battlefield. And when they're talking about nuclear war, that is an extremely troubling implication. So I just, I needed to, to mention that. Of course, the most important thrust of this video is to keep in mind that the so-called enlightened European powers that supposedly ended colonialism are still deeply neocolonialist, not only in the economic architecture of capitalism, which is based on imperialism and neocolonialism. So many of the countries in the global South that in the 50s, 60s, and 70s got formal independence from European colonialism politically, they still were suffering from economic neocolonialism. And that was famously articulated by Nkrumah, who was the revolutionary leader who helped lead the national liberation movement and became the first leader of Ghana. And Nkrumah said very clearly, Kwame Nkrumah, that the, the formal era of political colonialism and but they entered the era of neocolonialism in which capitalism economically subordinates countries in the global south, trapping them in debt through instruments of U.S. power like the IMF and the World Bank and other institutions. So, you know, Western corporations exploiting the global south, extracting their resources. The point is that Europe is still a deeply colonial institution, a, a deeply colonial region of the world, and the European Union itself is a deeply neocolonial institution. 
So that's the main point I really needed to stress in this video. And the in his comments, Borrell's comments, condemning the Global South for refusing to vote in lockstep with Western imperialists, and his his willingness to talk about nuclear war show how dangerous this moment is historically.